It's all good. You can hear me also. Try it. Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, okay, good. Okay, let's start in half a minute. If you can settle. Oh, less than half a minute, according to my watch. <laughs> Okay, so let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone again. It's good to see a bigger room. There's no, there's no party going on apparently today uh, somewhere. <laughs> or if there's something going on, you don't know about it. You're missing out. Uh, but hopefully you're learning uh, a lot more interesting things, let's say. <laughs> so we're going to, uh, today we're gonna switch gears and talk about uh, architecture actually. And then we're gonna delve into microarchitecture as well we're going to raise the abstraction level in this course but before i do that uh, i want to uh, cover a little bit more timing and i would like to refer you to a video that will be very useful for your labs for verification and testing but i would like to motivate the importance of it uh, we just wanted to offload it to a video so that you can actually use it on your own pace and this is going to be useful for your labs especially but verification and testing is of course very important beyond your labs so last week, uh, uh, well, last Friday, unfortunately, my voice was terrible. I couldn't attend uh, after Thursday's lecture. I lost my voice, and I think you, would have, uh, you wouldn't have liked it if I lectured, it in, lectured in person. Right now, I'm back, maybe let's say 90%. So it's still not the great, but not bad. Uh, so Mohamed Sadr, who was a senior researcher in my group, took the timing and verification lecture. He covered timing and computational circuits, sequential circuits, uh, these are really important concepts because uh, this is how you can decide the clock cycle time and how you can ensure that you can actually have a fast uh, processor. And we will see the importance of clock cycle time on and on later in this course. So we determined how, uh, how actually to determine the critical path of circuitry uh, based on uh, the timing of individual components bo for both combinational logic as well as sequential logic. So I'm not gonna go over that. What we could not cover was circuit verification and testing. I will briefly mention that. So this is basically very important because uh, this helps you answer the question, does this circuit work correctly in terms of functionality? That's called functional verification and testing. Or, and in terms of timing, if you consider the timing, does this, uh, does this circuit work correctly? These are two different issues as we discussed, right? Functionally, a circuit may be correct, but timing wise, you may get the incorrect result because you did not set the clock cycle time correctly based on the uh, timing of the individual components that go into the combinational and sequential circuits. And uh, briefly, we will cover offline and online testing. But as I said, I will uh, mainly uh, refer you to a lecture. Uh, any questions? Okay, can you see the screen very well from the back? Everything's good? Okay, just to make sure. Okay, so just to remind you, timing in a single sequential component is determined by the maximum logic delay across different combinational different possible combinational paths uh, through the combination logic that connects one register to another. So we, we figured out how to compute the maximum logic delay that goes through this register and then the combination logic and then uh, the, uh, to, to flash the data into this register as well. So that's your uh, clock cycle time or maximum clock, uh, 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 clock uh, minimum clock cycle time at which you can operate the circuit, right? Uh, and uh, as you know, both the sequential and combinational components are involved in it. You can watch the lecture from last time if you want to remember. Uh, so there are multiple paths in this combination logic, clearly. So you need to find the maximum combination logic path. And the maximum delay uh, maximum delay may be dependent on the input also. So we, we, we said that it, there could be multiple factors, but the input itself uh, can also affect this. So keep that in mind. For example, uh, let me give you a very simple example. If you're multiplying, if, let's assume that this combination logic is a multiplier. And let's assume that you have two inputs, two numbers that are input, and then the result is stored in a register over here. Now multiplication by zero is different from multiplication by one, which is different from multiplication by any other number, let's say. Multiplication by two is actually also different. So basically there are different inputs that you can have. You have number A and then number B may be zero. Number B may be one, number B, B may be two, and number B may be a, a, a power of two, 
and number B, maybe something else, right? So these different inputs actually exercise different paths in the circuit. Also, this depends on the design of your multiplier, right? You could design your multiplier such that it detects the special case. Multiply by zero, I detect it, and I don't do the complex multiplication. I don't power on the complex multiplication circuitry because it's expensive. So I just detect with an equal, a zero checker. Remember, you, you know how to build a zero checker, equality checker also. So you can detect whether one input is zero, and then you can basically uh, have a combination logic that outputs the result as zero, right? Now I built uh, a shortcut that basically determines what is the input. Uh, and based on that, it, it uses different combination logic paths inside the circuitry to do the multiplication. Multiplication by one, again, you can detect that as a special case, right? And then uh, you basically simply uh, latch uh, one of the inputs, uh, well, the non-one input in the output uh, registers over here. If you detect that, uh, there's one non-one input, right? Uh, well, there's one uh, input with a value one, right? So basically, this combination logic uh, may have different paths, and those different paths may be dependent on the input values also. Keep that in mind. Input value dependence is really important in terms of determining critical uh, path. And when you actually determine the critical path, if you design a circuit like this, or if the input values happen to affect the combination logic delay, which they do, uh, then you really need to test. If you really want to verify, for example, whether this works or not, you really need to test it with a bunch of different input values. And that's what the uh, verification and testing lecture is going to be about, and you're going to watch it, and you're going to see the uh, importance of it. Because, for example, if you're doing, uh, if, you're, if you're even adding uh, two 32-bit uh, numbers, there are a lot of combinations uh, 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 in which input values may be combined. Right. You can imagine how, what those combinations are, right? One 32-bit one number can take two to the 32 possible values. Another 32-bit number can take two to the 32 possible values. And these are independent events. So you have actually two times uh, two to the 33 possible combinations that you have over there, right? Okay. Anyway, I don't want to uh, go into a lot more detail over here, but basically uh, you, know that the, you, know, you know now that the combination logic uh, delay is dependent on uh, the input values also. So assume that you've determined that nicely, which you should uh, if you, in order to set your clock time correctly. Uh, what happens when you have multiple sequential components? So multiple sequential components exist because you may have a multiplier here, for example. Uh, you may have an adder over here. You may, have, you may be doing something else, accessing memory in some other part of the processor, as we will see today. Basically, a, a microprocessor or, in general, a, a system, computing system today consists of multiple different sequential components. You can think of it uh, as multiple different pairs of flip-flops that are connected to each other with some combination logic inside. I just, I just show you two over here. Now, if you want to determine a global clock cycle for your entire microprocessor, then you need to figure out the maximum logic delay across all of these different sequential components. So imagine thousands of these sequential components. You need to figure out what's the maximum combination, lo maximum logic delay across all of those. So that's why setting the clock cycle time of a processor is actually an arduous task that requires a lot of effort. There's, there are a lot of things that go into it. And uh, if you actually figure that one path is to uh, compare that and doing things in multiple clock cycles. And we will see that also. My internet connection is unstable. I hope that's not, that's not bad. <laughs> okay, so let me uh, finish with this final word in timing. So basically, you can meet timing constraints via principle design. I'm going to introduce three principles. We're going to see them later on also. Uh, but basically, uh, clock cycle time is determined by the maximum logic delay we can accommodate without violating the timing constraints uh, of the components that we're uh, building our circuit out of. So what are the, uh, there, there are three major design principles uh, that can help uh, design better timed circuits. One is critical path design. So what does this mean? This means that try to minimize the maximum logic delay. You have a maximum logic delay uh, globally, as well as locally, with, uh, globally across many components and locally within a, within a component. Try to minimize that as much as possible, of course. Especially put the effort on places where the logic delay is the maximum globally. Right? So uh, this clearly is good because it maximizes performance, assuming that's the goal, right? If you are happy with the performance, of course, then maybe you don't care about this. But our goal is always push the boundary of the state of the art and maximize performance. So how do you uh, uh, help critical path design? What I said uh, earlier holds basically. If, if, if one combination logic is taking too long compared to any others in the system, 
figure that out, figure out what that is, and cut it into two cycles, two clock cycles, for example. And we will see that later on. The second principle is balance design. And this kind of uh, is different because it's really about balancing the logic delay across different multiple components that we have seen earlier. For example, if you have these two components, try to balance the maximum, uh, maximum logic delay across them. Design them in such a way that the maximum logic delay is balanced such that you don't have uh, one or two or three components that are outliers that dominate your clock cycle time. So that's the idea. So of course, critical path design can be combined with balance design uh, together. So this is the, the upside of this is again, no bottlenecks. Uh, and it also minimizes wasted time. So if one component is doing actually, uh, uh, one of these uh, sequential components is uh, finishing its work, let's say early, uh, the clock cycle is too long for it. You're really wasting that clock cycle for that component. You can think of it that way. You can uh, basically it's, it's wasted work. And we will see this uh, later on as well. Okay, I just wanna give you these principles before we move on. And the third one is bread and butter design. Uh, this is an interesting name for common case design. Basically, optimize for the common case. Optimize for what matters. That's why it's called bread and butter, right? If you if you work, uh, if you have a company, uh, and if you're designing some products that are making the most money, let's say, that's the bread and butter of the company. That's why it's called bread and butter design. That's the common case of the company. That's what you should really shoot for. Let's say, basically, optimize for the common case, but make sure that non-common cases do not overwhelm the design when they occur. This maximizes the performance uh, for common use cases. For example, uh, maybe uh, you have, uh, uh, so one option could be, maybe you have a square root unit, let's say, right? Your square root unit is over here uh, and you have an adder unit. Now adder unit, you optimize a lot, perhaps, because ads, you see, uh, in all, all programs use ads, uh, ad instructions, but square root, not that many programs actually take square root of a number, right? So you may have a, hard, a specialized hardware unit that computes the square root of a number, but maybe you design it in such a way that it's not as fast. Uh, but that square root unit, the maximum logic delay in that square root unit should not affect the maximum logic delay that the add unit operates with. Because adder is the more important part for you in this case, right? Most people, let's say 99.9999% uh, of the people care about the add and a very small fraction care about the square root. So you should not really design for the square root, if you will. So this is an example where uh, you, you really need to think about the bread and butter. And this is important, especially when you have limited time, right? Limited time and resources. Of course, in the end, square root may be very important for a small fraction of programs, but we have limited resources also. Which one are you going to dedicate your resources into? That's where bread and butter design makes sense. So this maximizes performance for common use cases, without hopefully hurting the non-common cases. The, this doesn't say, don't optimize a square root unit. This says, don't make other more important units dependent on the non-common case, right? So we will see this later on when we design single cycle microarchitectures. They make this critical mistake of uh, making the entire, entire machine's performance dependent on the worst possible case. So you should not really design for the worst case. You should really design for the common case uh, if you want to optimize for performance. Does that make sense? So these are actually design principles for performance. For security, there may be other design principles that we're not going to talk about. So security, actually worst case design may be very interesting, but I talked about performance here. Okay, so that's timing. I'm done with timing. Uh, let's talk about verification and testing a little bit. You're going to do a lot of this in your labs, verification and testing to make sure that your designs work both functionally and timing wise. Uh, and this is done uh, via verification and testing methods. So there are two types of verification and testing. One is functional or logical, and the other is timing, just like we've seen right uh, earlier. Uh, you make sure the circuit logically operates correctly in the functional verification. Uh, there are multiple methods of it. I'm not going to go through uh, this here, but you're gonna watch a lecture. Uh, so you can do simulation, for example, uh, you can do formal verification of circuits, which is very difficult to do, especially with very, very large circuits. Imagine, uh, well, not imagine, we're dealing with billions of transistors today, trillions of transistors. Formally verifying everything that goes on in those trillions of transistors is actually very, very difficult. Simulation is also difficult, but it helps. Automating things actually helps a lot, as you will see. So timing is even worse uh, because it adds more variables into the system. It's, it actually adds another dimension, if you will. This makes sure, and, and, and the goal here is to make sure the circuit operates correctly when timing of the components is considered. 
And this is more, even more difficult, basically. Functional verification is difficult, but timing is also very difficult. Usually, the way you do uh, verification and testing today is by applying inputs to a component and observing the outputs. Do the outputs match? Uh, this is functional verification. Do the outputs match uh, the output I would expect given these inputs? Right? For an adder, you can define this very easily. If I'm adding two 32-bit numbers, uh, I know the space of the inputs. Uh, and I know the uh, space of the outputs. Given these two 32-bit numbers, this is what I expect from an adder, right? And if if you're uh, and you do this functional testing by applying these inputs, but think about exhaustively testing it. Exhaustively testing it is very difficult because we're talking about two to the 32 different possible inputs uh, for each of those values, input values in a two-bit adder. So exhaustive testing is very difficult in today's circuits. Uh, so people usually resort to randomized testing or some other testing methods that we will not cover, but hopefully you can think about when you watch the lecture. So timing adds additional uh, issues over here. How do you verify the timing becomes even more difficult uh, as you will see in the lecture also. So because of this, I think I, I hope I've given you some uh, understanding of the complexity of the problem, right? I'm, I'm just talking about an adder. Even an adder has billions of possible test cases to test functionally. If you add timing to it, now you're actually exploring in space. A, an existing microprocessor has, well, a GPU has thousands of adders, and they're not simple adders. They're complicated adders. They're floating point adders, meaning the values that, uh, that the numbers can take is much greater than 2 to the 32. It's actually sometimes 2 to the 128. These are huge numbers, as you can see, right? So you cannot test every single input combination, clearly. So you need to do something smarter. But basically, because of this complexity, Verification and testing actually consume most of the manufacturing time of a uh, chip today. So this system, more than 70% of the cost and 70% of the time of the design is spent on uh, testing and verification based. Design, of course, takes time, yes, but verification and testing takes much more time. And it's done at many stages of the design. So for example, when you're designing a circuit, uh, let's say an adder, you do component level design. And then that adder is part of an ALU, you do module level design, uh, module level, sorry, component level verification and testing. And then that adder, that adder may be part of a functional unit or ALU. You do that component level verification and testing. That may be part of a core, let's say. Uh, you do that core's testing. And that, that core may be part of a bigger part of the uh, bigger module, let's say, uh, including a cache uh, and uh, a cache controller. You do that testing. And then you test the entire chip also. So there are multiple different uh, uh, stages. Uh, and also you do it at multiple levels. You may have actually higher level simulation and then lower level simulation. But that doesn't end after you manufacture the chip. So you send the chip to the, uh, to the uh, fab and the fab returns the chip back. You're not done. Does the chip work is a question basically. And most of the time it doesn't work immediately. There are some cases where it will fail. This is called post-silicon verification or post-silicon verif ver verification and testing. So you have to test whether the chip that you got was, uh, actually works or not as well. And that's a different method of testing. Now you actually put the chip into a test, uh, test bed, if you will, and then apply some programs, apply some test vectors to it. Uh, not even programs uh, initially. Initially, you apply some test vector. There's, in, in modern chips, uh, there are testing infrastructures. You can actually supply input values in ones and zeros to different components of a chip and do module level testing after the chip comes back. You're not exposed to it as users, but this is what's done. Modern chips actually have support for testing inside them so that when the chips come, the chips come back from the fab, the people who have manufactured it can test it and, and ensure that it works correct. So there's a lot of testing support inside the chips as well. So that's post-silicon. So I'm now giving you the complexity, full complexity of it, if you will. So basically, it's very uh, the key takeaway after all of this is it's very difficult to completely verify and test complex circuits. And as a result, we have issues <laughs> because we recall we have billions of transistors on a chip. Uh, even after so much verification and testing, errors still slip into the field. Now, I should also say that this is true for software also, uh, except software is a little bit easier to handle because, okay, you do testing, and software space is huge, of course, right? Even bigger, because software is, uh, I mean, you can do anything in software in the end. But the handling of software, I believe, can be easier because uh, you can fix things in software also, right? But hardware, if something doesn't work, and if they have no work around it, uh, no, no way to work around it, what do you do, right? Remanufacture the chip. And yes, there are cases where actually people have recalled the chips 
in the past because they had errors. Like Intel had this flo famous floating point division bug. Uh, they had this floating point divide instruction. And in very rare cases, uh, it gave the wrong result. And because of that, they had to recall these chips in 1995 or so uh, in one of those times, basically. Uh, okay. But the, basically, this is one of the examples of air slipping into the field. Uh, that's why doing this online uh, is critical in modern systems. Modern systems actually have support for online testing. Uh, you don't know about it, uh, but some cores uh, can be taken offline for short periods of time. And the operating system can, performs testing on the cores with some hardware support. This is called online testing. Uh, and this happens actually in some modern chips because of the complexity of the problem again. Because you, you may not be able to uncover a lot of the uh, t uh, timing and verification issues before manufacturing, right? Okay, any questions? So I spent a lot of time on the slide, but that shows you the importance of this uh, topic. But recall, I mentioned in lecture one, uh, we talked about silent data corruptions. This exactly goes into what I just talked about. These folks from Google and Facebook and everybody in industry uh, say that they have a new problem. I said that this is not a new problem. But this is a problem that, are affect that is affecting them today. They say cores are disobeying instructions, meaning that CPU cores sometimes miscalculate certain computation without getting any obvious error signal. They call these mercurial cores, corrupt execution errors. They have fancy terminology, <laughs> renaming things that say. Basically, this is happening because there are some errors in the hardware circuitry. And that's what they say in these works. If you're interested, you can watch these. As you can say, they say due to local silicon defects, not cosmic rays. So these are some silicon defects that happen uh, that are not discovered during manufacture time and that happen on, only under certain conditions. And they talk about some of these certain conditions when the temperature is high, for example, when the voltage is low, for example. So there may be some cases where timing becomes very tight because when you do the testing of timing, it's very difficult to test under uh, all conditions, temperatures and uh, temperatures and voltage. Right? So this is happening in the field today. And you can read interesting papers that uh, these two major uh, companies have written. Uh, and if you're interested, you can read the abstracts over here. I, ju I just put them for your benefit. Uh, but let me see. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, maybe I, I'm not going to. Uh, yeah, let's see. Let's see. In our large scale infrastructure, this is from Facebook. In our large scale infrastructure, we have run a vast library of silent error test scenarios across hundreds of thousands of machines in our fleet. This has resulted in hundreds of CPUs detected for these errors, showing that silent data corruptions are a systemic issue across generations. And then they monitored SDCs for a period longer than 18 months. Based on that experience, we determined that reducing silent data corruptions requires not only hardware resiliency and production detection, me production detection mechanisms, but also robust fault tolerant software architectures. So this has implications across the stack, as you can see, right? Can you actually fix all of these issues in hardware, I think it's, very, it's going to be very difficult to do going into the future because these issues are, are going to become a lot worse as the transistor sizes reduce, they become more vulnerable to this sort of issues. Uh, and as the chip complexity increases, it becomes much more difficult to test the chip for all possible cases under all possible conditions that these chips are going to be operated. Of course, this is, you can say this is not that safety critical. Now think about these chips potentially going into space, right? Potentially being used, used in something safety critical like self-driving cars. Now there, even hair issues exist, right? Because people are designing these chips and sometimes using these chips for that, those purposes. And if they're, if, they're not, if they're experiencing this sort of errors in, the worst, in, in some critical times, there's no going back, right? Okay, and remember Rohammer. So basically these are, uh, this is, uh, I see this as a verification and testing issue. So somebody needs to do the verification and testing online and online verification and testing methods can help, but there could be solutions across the stack like more fault, fault tolerant software architectures. But a lot of those fault tolerant software architectures can increase the uh, overheads. Uh, uh, so usually actually a lot of these are timing errors. So timing becomes worse at some point with high temperatures, for example, and uh, you get an error in these chips. On the other hand, there's functional errors. So remember Rohammer. Row hammer is a particular access pattern. You keep activating a row and a bit flips. This is a functional problem. There's nothing about timing over here. Functionally, your bits should not be flipping, right? So that's another issue that exists in real chips. And you can see that uh, this is this causes a security problem. And we've discussed this in an earlier lecture, very briefly in lecture one specifically. So you can see that the verification and testing is actually extremely important in modern chips. Uh, and people are trying to figure out how to handle this uh, today. 
Okay, so basically, uh, this is the last slide uh, before we complete the previous uh, lecture, let's say. There's a huge challenge and opportunity that uh, we have in, our, in modern systems today. And it's, it's really how to build robust systems. Robust means fun, uh, fundamentally reliable, safe, secure, and resilient. Uh, and verification and testing, both offline and online, are critical. Uh, and you will get a small glimpse of this in your labs. And to prepare for your labs, please watch Lecture 6C. Uh, it's going to be available later today. It gives you an overview of verification and testing approach and complexity, and especially examples of how to do testing in Verilog, because you're going to do a lot of the testing. You're going to write test benches, for example, to test your programs, and you're going to, if you actually uh, make that easier to write, it's got, your life is going to be easier. And remember that, always remember when you're doing your labs, you're dealing with, with a very small system. In real systems, when you go out into industry, for example, you'll be dealing with much larger systems and uh, that's going to complicate things a lot. And this is the lecture. Okay, any questions? No? Okay, so it's not time to take a break yet. <laughs> so we're going to jump into one Neumann model and instructions at architectures. As I said, we're going to switch gears, uh, but I just want to remind you of the extra credit assignments before we switch gears. So what have you learned so far? So, we, so far we've started with the transistor, uh, as a switch, and we basically built logic on top, on top of it, logic gates, and then we basically discussed how to make them work from a timing perspective, functional perspective, and how to verify and test them, right? So far, we've been dealing with the digital design part of this course. Now, in the rest of this course, we're going to assume that we know this digital design, and we're going to raise the abstraction level and talk about architecture and microarchitecture. But I'm going to sometimes mention uh, the logic level uh, structures as well, especially today's lecture and next few lectures. So basically, we're going to first start with the uh, instruction set architecture. So far, we have not talked about uh, how these logic gates are visible to the programmer. They were invisible to the programmer, right? That, we didn't discuss that. How do you actually design the interface between the hardware and software? What does the programmer assume the hardware provides? And how does the hardware actually provide that? This is the hardware software interface, and the implementation of the hardware software interface is going to be the microarchitecture. So today we're going to talk about the von Neumann model and talk about an example von Neumann machine and start the instructions at architectures, hopefully, and see some examples of how you can define an instruction in an instruction set architecture that the programmer can use and how the hardware can be designed to actually execute that instruction underneath. Of course, all building on what we have seen. What we have seen is irre not irrelevant. We're building up to something that the programmer can use now. And next week, we're going to talk about microarchitecture. And then it's going to be a, a very interesting, uh, let's say, uh, journey on different types of microarchitectures. And we will also mix the ISA sometimes in between. OK, so I think I've already said this. Uh, we're going to talk about the von Neumann model. We're going to talk about instruction set architectures, three different types of instructions, operate, data, movement, and control. We're going to talk about instruction formats, how to encode the instructions such that the machine the hardware can understand them. So decoders are going to be extremely important because we're going to use some encodings to encode what we want to tell the machine. And the machine is going to use the decoders to decode what we're telling the machine, right? So that decoder that we've seen and multiplexer, they're going to be very important constructs. And then we're going to talk about addressing modes. Addressing modes deal with how do you address the data uh, that, uh, that the instruction is going to compute on. So there are some readings. Uh, I'm going to especially follow Pat and Patel uh, uh, but some, uh, sometimes also use material from Harris and Harris as well. Uh, again, if you understand everything in the lecture, if you're comfortable doing the exercises, you don't need to do any readings, but readings actually have some more material than uh, what I talk about. And we'll, we'll talk about programming uh, hopefully tomorrow. And next week, as I said, microarchitecture. Okay, so we've been talking about a building a computing system. And today we're going to kind of tie it to how the programmer sees that computing system. And uh, we're going to tie it with the perspective of the von Neumann model. This is one way of uh, building computing systems, one model of execution for computing systems. This is not the only model, but this is the dominant model. And we will see what that is. So, but recall, uh, before we have seen this picture uh, where we have three components of a computer, processing, memory, and I.O. And we're going to talk more about these components. Uh, and in the past lectures, we've seen combinational logic structures and sequential logic structures to essentially design all of these components even though we didn't put everything together, of course. Uh, with these structures, we can build execution units, decision units, memory and storage units, and communication units. We've seen all of these. All are basic elements of the computer. So today we'll raise our abstraction. 
how does the programmer see and manipulate what these basic elements do? Uh, essentially, use these logic structures to construct, construct a basic computer model and execution model. So let's say let's say, let's talk about what that is basically. From from a high level perspective, as users, programmers, we want to get a task done by a computer, right? And I'm going to talk about the context of general purpose computers like CPUs today, like Intel, ARM, X, uh, ARM, uh, Apple type of CPUs. I'm not going to talk about accelerators, machine learning accelerators, FPGAs, not so much GPUs, not uh, in this lecture at least. So the goal is general purpose computation because the other methods, especially uh, accelerators and FPGAs, reconfigurable units, have different ways of interfacing with the programmer and user. But uh, we need a computer program, essentially, for a general purpose computer. Uh, and the computer specifies what the computer must do, right? There's a set of instructions, as we will see. And of course, we need the computer itself to carry out the specified task, task specified by the program. Okay, so hopefully this is obvious, but it's good to uh, lay these down. So what is a program? Program is a set of instructions. Again, this is in general purpose computers. Each instruction specifies a well-defined piece of work that the computer should carry out. This is what the programmer tells the computer to carry out. So of course, this well-defined piece, uh, piece of work needs to be agreed on. And that's what the hardware software interface is all about. An instruction is the smallest piece of work specified in a program, meaning a programmer cannot specify anything smaller than an instruction. So if the instruction, uh, basically, this is the basic unit of work uh, from the programmer's perspective. right? There may be other smaller components, of course, in a computer system, but the programmer cannot directly manipulate them using instructions. Uh, unless, unless there's an instruction to manipulate them directly. Right? And the instruction set is all possible set of inst all possible instructions that a computer is designed to be able to carry out. This is a set of instructions, basically. Okay. So what is the von Neumann model? So this is these are some basics. This doesn't say anything about so far what we've covered in this slide doesn't say anything about how to execute these instructions. What should the programmer expect? Right. You need a really a model of processing these instructions. Uh, or processing computer programs in order to build a computer. Uh, at least one execution model. Of course, a computer may support multiple execution models, as we will see later on. And uh, John von Neumann, uh, who actually studied at ETH for some time, uh, proposed a fundamental model uh, in 1946, actually earlier than 1946, but he published one of the papers in 1946. This is the guy, as you can see. Uh, and this is a paper with his colleagues uh, that he wrote uh, that talks about this model. And this model consists of, this model has actually two hallmark characteristics, sequential instruction processing and stored program computation. Now you should really remember all of those after this lecture. We will get to that. But this model consists of five different components of a computer. Memory stores the program and data together. Uh, and there's no distinction between program and data. These are bits in memory, and we will see that. Processing unit processes the instructions, input, output, and a control unit. And this controls the order in which instructions are carried out. And this is a sequential processing order, as we will see. So these are the five components. Hopefully, you're familiar with it. We're going to go through all of these components soon. And throughout this lecture, uh, uh, this particular lecture and tomorrow, and later also a little bit, we will examine two examples, the two example instruction set architectures that obey the von Neumann model, which is LC3 and LC3B, little computer. Essentially, it's an instructional computer that is good for education, uh, in my opinion. In fact, I learned uh, uh, in, in late 1990s uh, uh, how to uh, design microarchitecture and architecture uh, using LC3 and LC3B. So it's an instructional computer. MIPS is a real instruction set architecture that's employed in some real systems. Uh, and we're going give, to give examples from that. There are a bunch of other instruction set architectures, as we will see. Uh, this is essentially the hardware software interface. Some people define how the computer uh, uh, what, what the programmer should, can expect from the computer. Okay, all general purpose computers today use the von Neumann model. That's why we're studying it. Uh, it's, so, it's been so popular and so useful for developing programs. Uh, and CPUs certainly do. But if you look at things like GPUs, fundamentally they build on the von Neumann model, actually. There's a lot of parallelism that happens in a GPU, yes, but fundamentally they're von Neumann machines. Uh, they add some parallelism to it, of course. Uh, but machine learning accelerators are a little bit different, as we will see. Some of the machine learning accelerators that are not based on the GPU principles are a little bit different. Systolic arrays, for example, we're going to cover that. And FPGAs are also 
quite different actually, as we will see, and as you will see in your labs as well. So this is a pictorial uh, view of the von Neumann model. You can see that there's memory. Uh, and I'm gonna go through one of the, each of these components. And memory you've already seen actually, except we're gonna add two more things over here. We're gonna add a memory address register, which is the input to memory. What's the memory address? And the memory data register, which is the output or input to memory. What's the data that you get out of memory if you are reading from memory? And what's the data that you're going to write to memory if you're writing into memory? So this is an example memory. You've seen this, right? This is how the underlying memory may look like. This is a very simple one, clearly. Basically, we're going to add a memory address register to connect to the address and a memory data register to connect to the output data as well as the input data. Depending on what you're doing to the memory, that memory data register will input the data into memory uh, or output the data from memory. Okay, so memory stores programs and data. It contains bits, uh, uh, binary digits, basically. Bits are logically grouped into bytes, eight bits, and words. Word is defined by the architecture. Again, it depends on the architecture. Word may be 32 bits in one architecture, 16 bits in another architecture, as you will see soon. We've already described this, actually, when we talked about memory, but let's describe this again. From the programmer's perspective, there's an address space. This is the total number of uniquely identifiable locations in memory. For example, in LC3, we will see that the address space is 2 to the 16. There are 16 bit addresses, so there are 2 to the 16 possible locations. In MIPS, the address space is 2 to the 32. There are 2 to the 32 possible locations. x 64 today we're at 48 bit addresses. This may increase. Over time, instruction set architectures also evolve, and these may increase. Addressability is how many bits are stored in each location, in each address, essentially. So, for example, a computer may be 8 bit addressable or byte addressable, in other words, or word addressable. Uh, a given instruction can operate on a byte uh, or a word. So for example, in LC3, it's word addressable. It has two to the 16 possible locations. Each of those locations stores 16 bits because the word size, the ISA designer determined it to be 16 bits, right? In MIPS, it's actually byte addressable. You have two to the 32 locations and each location stores eight uh, bits. Okay, let's give a simple example without going into those large numbers. This is a representation of memory with eight locations. Now you should know how to construct this using a decoder, a memory array, and the multiplexers at the end. But you can see that there are eight possible addresses, meaning the address bits are three. Uh, each location contains eight bits, one byte in this particular case. Uh, and this is byte addressable memory, address space is eight, based on the definitions. And you can see that uh, in address four, we stored value six, and address six, we stored value uh, four. Again, you can look at that. So how can we make the same size memory bit addressable? Well, that's an easy question, so I'll go through it relatively quickly. But basically, instead of having eight locations, now uh, have 64 locations. Because if you think about the same size memory, what's the size of this memory? Eight locations times eight bits, 64 bits. So we have total 64 bits. And we want to make it bit addressable. Every single bit we should be able to address from the programmer's perspective. So I need actually six address bits for that, 64 locations, and each location stores one bit. Right? So you can think of it as a 64 bit bit vector. Right? Okay, so hopefully that's clear. Uh, if you think about, let's talk about word addressable memory. So in a word addressable memory, each word uh, has, a, each data word has a unique address. In MIPS, as I said, word, uh, word size is dependent uh, on the ISA, instructions that architecture. In MIPS, a unique address exists for each 32-bit data word. In LC3, a unique address uh, exists for each 16-bit data word. These are the data words that is defined by the instruction set architecture. So let's take a look at MIPS memory. So MIPS memory act is actually byte addressable, but I'm going to kind of going to uh, talk about uh, a butchered MIPS memory that we use as word addressable in this case, just to make a point later on. So you can see that a MIPS memory looks like this. This is word zero. It has uh, each of them is a byte, so you have 32 uh, bits over here, right? No, each of these is, uh, wait, each of these is four bits over here. So two of these is uh, a byte over here, and then you have uh, eight bytes, uh, no, four bytes over here, sorry. Uh, yeah, because we're using the hexadecimal notation. So there, uh, there are four bytes over here. Uh, and uh, this is word zero, this is word one, this is word two, this is word three, right? And this is what's stored in memory. It just happens to be that way. And we're going to give an address to it, basically. This is the word address, right? One, zero, one, two, three, okay? Okay, so let's take a look at the byte addressable version of this. Each byte, in this case, is a unique address. MIPS is actually byte addressable, as I said. 
LC3B is also wide addressable. That's an updated version that we will see briefly. So it looks kind of like this, basically. We're going to, I'm going to keep the, I'm going to preserve the word uh, view of memory. Here, we cannot address individual uh, bytes, basically. Whenever the programmer needs to uh, address something, they refer to address zero, and that gives you a 32 bits word. If the programmer actually needs to take out a particular bytes, for example, EF over here, they need to manipulate that word and zero off the top and then do something with that byte, basically. So that's the difference between word and byte addressable memory. If you look at the byte addressable memory, the same example, except now we're going to have, give the ability to the programmer to address individual bytes. So this is one byte, this another byte, this another byte, this another byte. These are the word addresses. Now the word address of this is zero. The word address of the second word is four because there, there are four bytes over here. So one of them is zero, one of them is address one, one of them is address two, another of, uh, of it is address three, right? So word addresses have changed right now, right? As you can see, zero, four, eight, C, because each byte is addressable by the programmer. Now this way, the programmer can say, I want to get the byte at address two. Let's assume that that happens to be CD and the programmer can directly address CD, right? Whereas in the word addressable version, they couldn't. So you can see that there's a fundamental uh, trade-off over here. What do you expose to the programmer from the perspective of memory? Is it word? Is it an entire word? Or is it each individual byte? Now you can take this to the extreme and say, is it going to be each individual bit? Now it turns out bit level uh, manipulation is not as common in programs. That's why most ISAs are byte addressable today. They give the freedom to the programmer to address bytes. Word addressability is also not that common because people have figured out that words are too large of a granularity. Many programmers use byte level uh, as a good uh, way of dealing with, let's say, data. Okay, but this doesn't mean that th th there could be instructions in the ISA that can load words, that can load bytes, as we will see. Okay, so now we have an issue over here, though. So if you look over here, uh, I said this is word address zero, word address four, word address eight, but we have four bytes inside the word. How are we going to address them? How are we going to order that? And this immediately causes, I don't want to call it a problem, but a convention difference. Which of those four bytes is the most versus least significant? The programmer needs to know that, right? Otherwise, the programmer puts something into memory, and they need to know how to actually get, or somebody else puts something into memory, and the, the programmer needs to get the most significant byte uh, uh, out of, for example, this word. Is it EF or is it 8, 9? Which one is the most significant part of this, let's say, value? Assume that this is a value, right? So this convention needs to be defined. Otherwise, you cannot make sense of, you cannot communicate uh, uh, between different programs or uh, different people cannot even communicate across using different programs. Okay, so the, uh, I, I won't take a, a detour over here. This is basically a convention, right? And it's very similar. Uh, the, the naming of this is, uh, this comes from Gulliver's Travels. How many people have read Gulliver's Travels here? Okay, how many people know about Gulliver's Travels? How many people watched Gulliver's Travels? <laughs> okay, some people. So this is clearly a famous book. I read it when I was a kid. But uh, there's a section in the book where big endians, these are called, people called big endians, they break their eggs on the big end of the egg. Let's take a look. So if you want to eat this egg, do you break it from here? Or do you start from here? So these guys used to break their eggs uh, using... Uh, uh, from the big side of the egg. And then some king came, and as usual, as, as the kings do, they dictate things. And this guy dictated them to actually start breaking their eggs from the little end. So it's a convention. There's no right or wrong, clearly here, right? Where do you start? So in order to make sense out of our memory, we need to define this convention also. And different ISAs, different instructions and architectures defined in different ways. So for example, big endian here, the, the definition of a big endian machine is that least significant bits, no, sorry, least significant bytes in a word is in the higher byte address. So if you look at this, this is called big endian. Uh, this is the word address, zero. The byte address zero contains the most significant byte. Byte address three contains the least significant byte. Just happens that way. That's the convention. In the little endian machine, most significant, uh, least significant byte is in the lower byte address. So a zero over here. And address three, byte address three, contains the most significant byte. So does this matter? In most cases, don't, they, it doesn't matter. 
but you should know about it clearly when you're writing a program so that you put the right bytes in the right place. But when it really matters uh, is when you're communicating with these different systems, right? There's a little Indian, there's a machine with a little Indian ISA like a x86, and then there's a machine with a big Indian ISA like Spark. So these are real ISAs, and they're communicating through a network, and one of them is going to send something to the other one. You really need to know whether the things that are sent are sent in a big Indian uh, convention versus a little Indian convention. Because if you do the wrong thing, you may actually get the data completely wrong. Right? So that's the problem, basically. Whenever you have conventions, if you actually are limited to the world that always uses that convention, you may be OK. But when you're communicating with the outside where someone, someone uses a different convention, you have a problem. So uh, an example of this is maybe it's not a perfect example, but some countries of the world, uh, you drive on the left side of the road. And some, some other countries, you drive on the right side of the road. It's a convention. There is no right or wrong over here. Again, right? somebody defined that convention right? for whatever historical reason. When you want to go from one country to another, especially if you're crossing uh, by land, you need to switch. Right? So how do you switch? Basically, you have to obey the convention. You don't want to go on the wrong side of the road, if you will. OK, uh, so, uh, OK, so this is how the memory is laid out. Layout of memory is defined by the instructions of the architecture. Now let's talk about uh, how uh, to access memory. So we're going to introduce two registers. I've already said that, memory address register and memory data register. And there are two ways of accessing memory. Reading, it's also called loading, a data from a memory location. And the other is writing or storing data to a memory location. And we're going to have instructions for both of these. As I said, there are two registers usually used to access memory. These don't need to be present, but in most modern systems, there has to be something like this because of uh, complexity of the system and sequential uh, nature of the system. You'll, normally, you latch the address of memory somewhere. That's called the memory address register. And then the data register, you latch the data somewhere else. So to be able to read, there are multiple steps, basically. Uh, you, uh, the, the, the system, the control logic, actually, in the end, as we will see, loads the memory address register with the address we wish to read from and then waits for some time, enables memory, as we will see later on also. Data in the corresponding location gets placed in the memory data register because the memory is enabled and the address is there and the data comes. And, uh, and, and you, you've already seen this actually. In the earlier memory, uh, just imagine that, okay, I'm gonna go to our small memory. Maybe that was a bad idea because it was so far. Okay, there you go. You have a memory address register connected to the address and write enable bit is zero. Uh, after some time, after some combination logic delay, the data gets placed in the memory data register at the end of the clock cycle. So this is a sequential system. So we're going to see that later on. Basically, at the end of a clock cycle, at the rising edge of the next clock cycle, or maybe some other clock cycle, depending on how your memory has access, data in the corresponding location gets placed in the memory data register. Now you read from memory. To write to memory, you follow a similar thing, similar steps, basically. You load the memory address register with the address, and also the memory data register with the data that you wish to write. And you activate the write-enable signal. Remember the write-enable signal in the previous picture? I don't wanna go back to it because it takes such a long time. Uh, the value in the MDR is written to the address specified by the MAR, by the memory, once you do that. And we've, we've already built this memory to do that. Actually, let's go back. I said, I don't wanna go back, but I should go back maybe. Uh, where is this memory? Oh, okay, this is our memory, right? If you look at this, Basically, uh, you, you have the memory address register and you set the right enable bit. And the logic as we have defined it will make sure that the data that you put into the MDR, the, imagine an MDR that's connected over here. The data that you put into MDR gets written to the correct location specified by the MAR after some time. That some time is again dictated by the logic delay that we're dealing with that we saw in the last lecture. Right? Okay. So nothing is magic, basically. Everything that we're talking about right now, we've built up to. Uh, okay, good. Okay, so that's memory. And we're going to see a lot more of this soon. Let's talk about the processing unit. But I guess let's not talk about the processing unit. Let's take a break. Let's be back at uh, 15 after. And then we're going to talk about the processing units. <laughs>
Okay, I think people are back, are coming back. Uh, so the voice is still good online, right? Yeah, please check. I'll get started, but uh, so uh, remember we're continuing the von Neumann model. Uh, we've talked about memory. Now let's go into the processing unit. Processing unit is really the core of the von Neumann model. It really controls what is done in the processor. Now you can see also uh, there's a dis there's a clear distinction between processing unit and memory in a von Neumann model. We've talked about this in lecture one. Today's computing units are actually very processor centric. This is one of the places where it comes from. There's a processing unit that's completely separate from everything else. This is where the processing is done. That's it. Okay, so basically what does it do? It performs the actual computations. The processing unit can consist of many functional units. These are another word for the ALU, as you have seen earlier. Uh, so we start with a very simple arithmetic and logic unit, uh, which executes computation and logic operations. We've actually seen that uh, in an earlier lecture when we talked about combinational logic. Uh, so, for, uh, and, and this, uh, these functional units are exposed to the programmer via instructions. So the programmer essentially uh, can dictate what these functional units can do by executing instructions. So for example, in LC3, we have add, and, and not instructions that can be executed in these functional units. So these actually get executed in the processing unit in general. In LC3B, for example, you can say XOR. As I said, little computer is a little computer. It doesn't have a huge number of instructions. Uh, some other uh, instruction sets, real instruction sets, usually have more instructions, and this is just a subset of them. For example, you see multiply, uh, you see uh, shift uh, logical left, shift logical right, set less than. We've seen some of these earlier, actually. A bunch of different instructions. So processing unit does all of these. If you have a square root instruction, it does square root. If you have a floating point multiplication, it does floating point multiplication. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, the arithmetic logic unit processes quantities that are referred to as words. And this is uh, uh, where the word length really comes from. Word length in LC3 is 16 bits. Word length in MIPS is 32 bits. So when, when people talk about, for example, I have a 64-bit computer, that's really referring to the word length. Uh, what is the maximum number of bits an operand in an ALU can take. I said operand, and one of the inputs to the ALU can take, basically. Of course, the ALU or the functional unit can operate on smaller granularities as well, 8 bits, 16 bits, but word length refers to the maximum granularity at which the functional unit is designed to perform computations on. Hopefully, these are relatively simple. So recall, we've actually seen this before. This was an example arithmetic logic unit for a subset of the MIPS ISA. Essentially, ALU combines a variety of arithmetic and logical operations into a single unit, but it performs only one function at a time. In a real processor, you may have thousands of these that are concurrently operating. In GPUs, for example, you have thousands of these. And in even in existing systems, there are lots of them today. Uh, so uh, the processing unit is big, basically, today. Uh, and again, I'm not going to uh, go through this in detail. We showed some examples in the combination logic lecture. There's no magic underneath. Basically, the, these slides are to show that what we've done before directly goes into what we're going to talk about. Programmer says not, or let's say add, and that add gets decoded somehow, and uh, that instruction gets communicated to the arithmetic logic unit, the processing unit, and the processing unit executes the instruction, writes the result back, obeying what the instruction is specifying. So there's no magic. You know exactly how the ALU is constructed, for example, or you can construct an ALU given an instruction set. Okay, so uh, this now we're going to talk about the importance of memory. <laughs> Even though we have a processing unit, this processing unit actually has some storage in it also. Why? Because memory is so important, basically. Uh, and this storage is fast temporary storage. They're called registers. Uh, so basically, uh, what I just said is true. It's almost always the case that a computer provides a small amount of storage very close to ALU as part of the processing unit. And the purpose is to store temporary values that are generated by the ALU so that you can quickly access them later. And this storage is actually visible to the programmer. The programmer can actually manipulate the storage. That they're called registers, as I said. So let me give you the motivation. For example, you want to calculate this relatively complicated uh, expression, A plus B multiplied by C divided by D. The intermediate result of A plus B can be stored in temporary storage in a register. Why? Because it's too slow to store each 
results, let's say a, you, did, you did A plus B using an add instruction, where do you store the results so that you can multiply it by C? One option is to store it into memory, main memory. But we already discussed that memory is too slow, right? So let's, uh, yeah, memory access is much slower than addition, multiplication, or division. Just to give you a better perspective, uh, an addition may take on the order of, I don't know, a couple of nanoseconds, even today's systems, less than uh, around one nanosecond, even less than nanosecond, actually, because we've optimized things well. But a memory access can take 150, 200 nanoseconds. So there's a huge difference. In some systems, there's a 600x difference between a memory access and a, an ALU operation. So that's true for other intermediate results. So the results of A times B multiplied by C uh, is also an intermediate result. Uh, where do you store it? So this temporary storage that's provided inside the processing unit is called registers. And the set of registers is called a register file. And again, this is programmer visible. Programmer sees this, programmer can address it, programmer can manipulate it. So we will see a lot of that. So that's why the processing unit looks like ALU and this temp. Temp is the temporary storage for registers. So I'm going to repeat this. Memory is large but slow. However, registers in the processing units are small. You don't have that many, basically. You ensure fast access to values to be processed in the ALU. That's the purpose. Typically, one register contains one word, same as the word length. This makes sense because the ALU is operating on the word length, maximum number of bits uh, that ALU can operate on. And the register set or register file is a set of registers that can be manipulated by instructions. So for example, LC3 has eight general purpose registers, only eight. It's relatively fast now, you can see. The memory can be billions of locations. The register file is only eight. So people figured out that eight is not a great number. So in real instruction set architectures, well, okay, before, we, before I jump on, uh, programmer, how does the programmer refer to those registers? Inside the instruction, they specify which register they want to write their results into, R0 to R7. These are addresses, basically. You can think of this as a memory, basically, consisting of eight locations. Each location has one word in LC3, 16 bits, basically. Uh, so the programmer can actually address these. But people figured out that eight is a, a small number. I already said this. Uh, eight is a small number. So real ISAs actually have more than eight registers, 32 general purpose registers in MIPS, for example. They're named R0 through R31. So you have a five bit register number or register ID in MIPS and register size or word length is 32 bits. So you can see that this is small storage and the goal is to capture uh, the reuse that happens uh, or communication that happens between different instructions that consume and produce values, right? So if you look at this expression over here, this expression can get translated to add A to B, store the result into register zero, and then multiply register zero to C. Of course, I'm not telling you exactly where these A, B, C are stored. We will see that later. Multiply register zero to C and store the result into register one, for example. And then divide register one by D and the store the result into, I don't know, somewhere. Right, it could be another register. So all of these can be in registers actually, and then the operations could be very fast. If they're in memory, you will need to somehow deal with getting the value out of the memory and putting into the registers, or your instructions that architectures, instructions that architecture may provide directly accessing memory without going through the registers. And we will see that also. Okay, so now we've defined these registers and almost all instructions that architectures today have this notion of registers exposed to the programmers for the reason that we have discussed. Memory is too slow, so have fast temporary storage available to, to the programmer such that the programmer can manipulate. How big is this? Depends on the definition of the instruction set architecture. For example, the x86 architecture that's used by Intel and AMD processors start out with eight general purpose registers. Today, I believe we're at 32 general purpose registers. Maybe it's higher right now. I don't, I lost track basically. Uh, why? Because People figured out that uh, in real programs, you manipulate values that are larger than number eight. Sometimes you need 16 values that you need to manipulate around the same time. These are temporary values. And if you don't have 16 registers, you have to go through a memory, right? And that's very slow. Okay, and we, again, uh, this is not magic. This register is what we have seen before. This is a four-bit register, of course. Imagine that being 32 bits. And imagine having 32 of them in MIPS. And yeah, this is a four bit register. And this is how we denoted it, if you remember. So, underlying implementation of the register, you know already. We're just connecting the dots. Now we're making it programmer visible uh, with some register file. Okay, 
And this was another example, right? So, okay, how does the programmer actually address these registers? There needs to be some convention, basically. Register numbers are actually encodings inside the uh, instruction format, as we will see later on. But the programmer usually programs at the assembly level or even at a higher level. So there are some names that are assigned to the registers uh, at the higher level. Register zero in MIPS happens to be very special. Uh, it basically is hardwired to the constant value zero. So this is how we generate a zero value in a machine. It's hardwired. If someone refers to register zero, it means zero, the value zero. Uh, you cannot write some other value to it because it doesn't exist. The definition of in the instruction set architecture says register zero, zero, period. If you write something to register zero, that value doesn't get written to register zero because register zero is always zero. Okay. And then there are some other registers. These are conventions. These are not necessarily strict because the ISA, instructions that architecture doesn't define these. Instructions that architecture just defines this and actually it defines the register number zero being zero also. But people have developed conventions so that they can ease programming. We will cover this in assembly programming later on, hopefully tomorrow. But you can actually, for example, have stack pointers, frame pointers, et cetera. We will talk about these uh, later on. Okay, so that's the processing unit. Any questions? Now I'm gonna talk about input and output just a little bit, not too much. Uh, these are clearly very important. As you can see, keyboard, mouse, disc, uh, printer, monitor. These are different input and output devices, as you can see. Uh, some of them are both input and output devices. Uh, going into the future, maybe some brain machine interface, right, that you have, that you may have, uh, could be some input and output device. So these are evolving clearly. Uh, there may be many other devices, of course, uh, some variable devices, et cetera. Uh, but uh, we're not gonna cover this in a lot of detail, but know that this is part of the architecture. So what do, they, what do these do? They enable information to get into and out of a computer. Uh, network is actually another input and output device, actually. Uh, so many devices can be used for input and output. They're also called peripherals. Uh, you can see some examples here. In LC3, we're gonna see keyboard and monitor. So we're gonna basically briefly cover these things and how to handle data coming from the keyboard, how to handle data going out into the monitor, for example. Uh, and they're important, clearly. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to cover much here. Uh, so the control unit, let's talk about that because this is really important. This is really perhaps the core of the von Neumann model, as I said, uh, because it dictates how the programs are executed. So it consists of two things over here, as you can see, program counter or instruction pointer and the instruction register. Uh, so what does it do? Essentially, it controls everything that happens in the machine. Uh, it's like the conductor of an orchestra, right? It's like a ma maestro. Uh, it conducts a step-by-step -step execution of a program. Uh, a little bit more detail, it conducts a step-by-step -step execution of every instruction in a program in sequential order. That's the definition of the control unit, basically. That's the task. Uh, so to be able to do this, it needs to keep track of multiple things. First of all, it needs to keep track of which instruction is being processed. This requires uh, an instruction register. An instruction register contains the instruction, essentially. These are the bits encoding of the instruction. Okay, we're gonna decode that to figure out what to do with it. It also keeps track of which instruction to process next via a pointer to the instruction or instruction pointer IP, or more commonly, this is called a program counter. This is essentially another register that contains the address of the instruction to process. Usually it's the next instruction to process because once you actually, so what is this basically? This is a memory address. And this memory address is a special memory address uh, because it contains the address of the instruction that you're going to fetch and put into the instruction register. That's the idea over here. And then once you fetch that instruction, automatically this instruction pointer gets incremented to the address of the next instruction. Remember, we're doing sequential instruction processing. That's the core of the von Neumann model. You go to the next instruction. And then after you process this instruction, the next instruction gets fetched from memory, placed into the instruction register. So the control unit is responsible for all of that. And we're gonna see more of this, of course. Hopefully that's clear, right? So this is called program counter for historical reasons. I like the name instruction pointer. Intel actually calls it instruction pointer. Uh, it really points to the instruction. Where is the instruction that you're gonna process in memory? It's a memory address, essentially. Whereas instruction register are actually the bytes of the instruction, actual bits of the instruction that you're gonna process right now. So you need to decode those bits. Okay, so we're gonna see this soon. But basically, so far, what we have defined is this. There is a programmer visible state. It's also called an architectural state that exists in computers. 
This is an example in von Neumann machine. There's a program counter, which contains the memory address of the current or next instruction, depending on when you look at this program counter, as we will see. If you look at it before the program counter gets incremented to point to the next instruction, then that's the current instruction. If you look at it after, then that's the next instruction. Uh, and then there is a register file uh, or registers. These have special names in the ISA. And there could be general purpose or special purpose. We're going to deal with mainly general purpose registers, but there could be special purpose registers that are also exposed to the programmer just to make sure the programmer can actually deal with the machine, for example, the system state. Is there an error in the machine? That could be actually indicated in a special purpose register, for example, and the programmer can check that. We're not going to deal with that. We're going to talk about general purpose registers that almost every programmer deals with. And then there's a the memory, of course, right? This is an array of storage lo locations indexed by an address. So essentially, registers are a very special form of memory. It's fast, small, and it's directly manipulated by uh, uh, the programmer using a different address space. So the address space of memory are memory address space, and then there's another address space for registers. It's called the register address space. So if you think about this, instructions and programs, programs are essentially a set of instructions, right? Uh, specify how to transform the values of programmer visible state. So we're talking about state, right? I, 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 the reason I use the name state over here is for a particular reason, because we've seen state in sequential logic. This is the same state. These are actually state variables. And this is the entire state of the machine, assuming that this is all you have uh, that's programmer visible. This is the state of the machine that's visible to the program. So what an instruction does is transition the machine from one state to another state. So you can think of the processing of an instruction as going through one state of the machine to another state based on the specification of the instruction. So essentially, the entire machine is a finite state machine. And instructions take the machine from one state to another state. And that happens based on the specification of the instruction. Of course, we're going to see those specifications of the instruction. So keep this in mind. We're, we're really talking about a finite state machine at this point. And this finite state machine needs to obey what is defined by the instructions at architecture. What should this instruction do? Based on, uh, I'm in this current state. Uh, how, do, uh, how do I go to the next state? That is determined by what is the current state, as well as what should happen based on the instruction that was specified. OK, uh, we're going to get back to this. You're going to see the finite state machine, actually, that we're going to deal with in LC3. So this is the von Neumann model. I've defined, actually, all of the components over here. We're going to go into more detail in each of these components now. Any questions? Okay, so uh, I've implicitly actually uh, given you the two key properties of the von Neumann model. This is actually uh, very important because this is what made von Neumann model very successful. It was very easy to program overall. Uh, it's called a stored program computer also, but von Neumann model is, I think, nicer because it, uh, it, it, it captures two properties. Stored program because instructions are in memory, right? Program is in memory, essentially. So there are two key properties. Stored program, let's talk about that. It's interesting. Uh, instructions are stored in a linear memory array, essentially. So you have this memory, right? So let's go back to this memory over here. Part of this memory contains a program also. So a program is there, data is there. So how do you distinguish between them? Memory is unified between instruction and data. How do you distinguish between them uh, is determined based on where this control unit is. So if the control unit is actually using uh, the pro program counter to access memory, you interpret that location as a bits of, bits of an instruction. Basically, the value at that memory location is interpreted as an instruction. Whereas if you're in the sequence in the control unit, when you're accessing memory, for example, to do a load of a value, data value, then you treat that location, uh, the value of a location as a data value. So basically, the interpretation of a stored value in memory depends on where you are in the processing cycle of an instruction or control signals. So I have not defined control signals yet, but you've seen examples of control signals. Basically, control signals are generated by the control unit to, uh, to basically orchestrate the execution of an instruction. You, for example, generate control signals to fetch the instruction from memory. To be able to do that, you take the program counter, put it into the memory address register, as we will see, and you generate the control signals to be able to do that. So that's a particular processing stage where the value in memory is interpreted as an instruction, because that's the part of the processing stage where you're fetching the instruction. 
You may be in a separate processing stage where you're actually loading the data value of the instruction. And we will see these. So uh, that's why control signals are very important. There's a finite state machine. Again, this also connects to the finite state machine because which state you're in in the finite state machine in part determines the control signals, as you will see. Okay, keep this in mind. You will see this multiple times over and over. Let's talk about sequential instruction processing because arguably this is even the more important part of the von Neumann model. And this basically says that one instruction is processed, in other words, fetched, executed, completed at a time. Program counter or instruction pointer identifies the current or the next instruction, depending on when you look at it, as I said. And the program counter is advanced sequentially uh, in, in sequence of addresses, except for control transfer instructions. Basically, this is a sequential execution. One program, uh, you have a sequence of instructions. You process one instruction. After it's done, you go to the next instruction. After it's done, you go to the next instruction. After it's done, you go to the next instruction. After it's done, you go to the next instruction. And this is what made the von Neumann model very successful because the programmer doesn't need to think much, right? The programmer writes a set of instructions that, is, that they assume to be executed in order, except when they need to jump around somewhere else, right? So they need to have control transfer instructions as we will see if they want to do something different based on a decision, for example, that needs to be made. This is called a branch as well. So these two properties are hallmarks of the von Neumann model. Any question? OK, we will see that the sequential instruction processing is broken, for example, in some other models, as uh, like systolic arrays. There's no sequential instruction processing. It's all parallel uh, in, in there. OK, so let's talk about an example of von Neumann machine. So we're going to look at uh, how these von Neumann machines operate. Uh, LC3 is not a real one. I don't believe that it, uh, any LC3 machine has been built uh, and certainly not used in real systems, but this is a von Neumann machine, or at least part of it is a von Neumann machine. So you see the cores, uh, you see the GPU. Neural engine is a bit different in terms of principles. So it's really heterogeneous, but a lot of it is uh, operating based on von Neumann principles. Okay, another von Neumann machine, another von Neumann machine. Basically, everything you use looks like a von Neumann machine today. So this is LC3. We're going to look at this a little bit. So let me take, a, take some time to uh, describe what this is because we're going to look at this picture a lot. Uh, so you can see there's a control unit, kind of. Uh, there's a processing unit over here. There's memory, there's input and output. So this is the keyboard. There's a keyboard data register, keyboard status register. There's a uh, output, uh, display status register, and display uh, data register. And you can see that there's a common bus, single set of wires, it's called the processor bus. And the communication between different units is done via this processor bus. For example, if you want to access memory, if the control unit says, I want to access memory, for whatever reason, it could be because you want to load the instruction, take the instruction at that address pointed to by program counter and put it into the instruction register. Then uh, the, uh, the uh, program counter is used actually, you can see that there's program counter, there's the instruction register. The control unit sets the control signals such that the program counter gets from there into the memory address register. So you need, there, there are a bunch of control signals, as you can see. So these are control signals, things that are marked with uh, white arrows, white ended arrows are control signals. They basically control uh, what should happen, uh, which multiplexer input should be used, uh, whether the uh, register should be enabled meaning loaded at the end of the clock cycle. Remember, this is a sequential machine. All of the finite state machine principles apply. A register gets loaded at the end of the current clock cycle. So there's a control signal that controls that. There's a control signal that controls what the ALU is doing. There's a control signal that controls which input this MUX is selecting. And you can see that these control signals are generated by the control units, okay? So we'll see how to generate these control signals in the next lectures. But, but today, hopefully, we're going to go into some of these uh, things as well. So there are also data signals. These data signals are essentially data uh, that uh, are going to be operated on. It could be uh, used to form an address. For example, program counter is an address of an instruction. It could be basically uh, used to be loaded uh, into the MAR. If the control signal says load MAR, then, uh, and if this control signal says gate PC, this is a tri-state buffer. If you remember the tri-state buffer, you take the program counter, Program counter gets loaded onto the bus, uh, gated onto the bus. We're going to use that terminology. And then if this control signal says load MAR, then the memory address register gets the program counter. Of course, none of the other gating signals should be enabled at that point, because if gate ALU is enabled at that point, you'll get garbage on the bus, right? 
as we discussed, you'll get a short circuit on the bus. You should not have two uh, two things, uh, two different values uh, put on the bus at the same time. So that's the job of the control unit. That's why control unit is so important. It needs to generate these control signals such that everything in the machine does what the control unit intends that uh, every single thing in the machine to do, right? And again, this is defined by a finite state machine as we will see. Okay, so you can see memory is over here. It's 16-bit addressable. It has the MAR, MDR. So we're gonna see these more. This is just to familiarize yourself. You can see that memory actually can, can put something onto the bus. There's a gate MDR signal. So if you're in a state where the memory is read and the data is ready in the memory data register, you go to a state where memory data register gets put on the bus, this gate MDR signal gets enabled by the control unit again, and the data comes, where's the destination? Well, it could be a register file. It could be a location in the register file, right? This depends on the, uh, this depends on the program. Uh, this depends on the instruction definition, of course, right? Then the control signal should specify that the register file should be loaded or enabled, or written with a write enable signal. You can think of the load reg as a write enable signal for the register file. Which destination register should be loaded? This comes actually from the instruction encoding, as we will see. Okay, so there's a memory address register, memory data register, there's a keyboard, there's a monitor, there's an ALU. As you can see, this is a very simple machine, only one ALU. There's a register file. There are eight general purpose registers. Uh, there's an instruction register in the control unit, as we have discussed, and there's a program counter. So we're gonna make use of all of these. And there is a finite state machine for generating the control signals. As you can see, that finite state machine takes as input the instruction register. These are the bits of the instruction, the encoding of the instruction. So this finite state machine actually consists of a decoder that decodes the instruction and based on where it is in the instruction processing cycle decides what control signals should be enabled. So in the entire machine, and as we will see. And you can see also that there's a clock. So this is a synchronous finite state machine with a clock. The control signals get generated. They're enabled for the full duration of a clock cycle. And at the end of the clock cycle, state changes and new control signals take effect. You go to a different state or you stay in the same state, depending on what's going on, right? And we will see both options. And then there's an ALU operation that's specified by the control signals that's generated by the finite state machine over here. Okay, and we, will talk, we already talked about the gating signals, right? There's a bunch of gating signals that control what value gets onto the processor bus. Okay, so let's take a look at, uh, so I know this was a lot, but we're gonna see all of these components over and over and over. This was just an initial introduction into a simple machine that can process instructions. And this doesn't have every single detail. So there's some address generation, for example, that we didn't show over there, but we will talk about. So let's talk about these two properties, and then we're gonna see how instructions are executed uh, in a von Neumann machine. So instructions and data are stored in memory. Typically, the instruction length is the word length. Not always, but typically. And the processor fetches instruction from memory sequentially, fetches one instruction, decodes and executes the instruction, continues with the next instruction after that. The address of the current instruction is stored in the program counter. Uh, in word addressable memory, the processor increments the program counter by one in LC3, for example, because we're assuming that the instruction size is the same as the word size. If in byte addressable memory, the processor increments the program counter by the instruction length in bytes, because memory address is byte addressable. In MIPS, for example, uh, the, each word is 32 bits, four bytes. So you need to increment the program counter by four to go to the next instruction. Okay, and then there's some, what do you, where do you start is always a question, right? When you start, when you reset the machine, what is the first instruction to execute? You need to point to something, basically that uh, is the first program to be executed. But you can read those details in, the, uh, in your books also. So let's take a look at a program. This is a sample MIPS program. It looks like this. There are four instructions stored in consecutive words in memory. You don't need to understand the program now, we'll get back to it. We're actually going to see all of these instructions and you're gonna do that in your labs also. Uh, so basically, uh, this is the assembly programming. There are some conventions that you need to follow. For example, what does, uh, this is a load word from uh, base address 32, uh, oh, sorry, base register zero, uh, uh, added to it 32, and then the result is loaded into temporary register two, for example, that's what the saying. So each instruction is encoded using some encoding that's specified by the instructions and architecture. So this is the machine code. And the machine can take this and interpret it. So you can actually, input this to a machine and input to a decoder, right? And the instructions are laid out like this inside memory. So it looks like this, for example, the lowest memory location is here. And this is the byte address. Initial address is this, and then instruction, each instruction is four bytes uh, apart uh, from each other. 
as you can see. Initially, the program counter points to this instruction. Once that instruction is executed, the program counter goes to the next instruction, and you keep doing this. As we said earlier, an instruction is the most basic unit of computer processing. This is really uh, the word in a language of a computer, if you can think of it that way. Instruction set architecture is the vocabulary of the computer. And the language of the computer can be written, as a uh, written in different ways. Machine language is the computer readable representation, zeros and ones. Basically, this, this is the machine code, this is the machine code. But it doesn't make much sense to us unless you're uh, very well versed in what's happening. Uh, so usually, human readable representation is the assembly language. That's why human readable representation gets converted into machine language. So we will study a bunch of LC3 instructions and MIPS instructions today and tomorrow. Principles are similar in all ISAs. So everything that we said applies to all of the ISAs. But let's take a look at what an instruction consists of. It's made up of two parts, actually, opcode and opends. Uh, let's take a look at what those are. Opcode specifies what the instruction does. This is really the command, if you will. Opends specify who the instruction is to do, uh, to do it to. Uh, basically, these are the things that are, you're manipulating. Right? Both are specified in the instruction format. Instruction format is also called instruction encoding. So as we said, LT3 instruction consists of 16 bits, or bits 15 through 0. So this is one encoding, for example, for an add instruction. This is the opcode. Bits 15 through 12 specify the opcode. So there are 16 dis distinct opcodes in LC3. And you can now see that this, these four bits can be input into a decoder. That decoder is a four, four input, two to the four output decoder. So you know exactly uh, which instruction it is just by looking at these bits. Right? And then bits 11 through 0 are used to figure out where the operands are. In this particular case, if this is the opcode, then the next three specify the destination register. Uh, the next three bits specify another uh, this, uh, one source register. And the bottom three bits specify uh, another source register. Now, bit 5 actually has uh, some special meaning, as we will discuss later. So, uh, OK, so hopefully this is clear, right? This is the machine interpretation. This is the encoding. And this encoding is specified by the ISA. So for example, these bits specify register 6, these bits specify register 2, these bits specify register 6. And this instruction is basically add register 2 to register 6 and write the result into register 6. That's what it specifies. That's the command. And we specify the opcode and operands. These bits are unused. Bit 5 has a special meaning, as we will see later. So there are three main types of instructions. Operate instructions execute in the ALU. Data movements instructions read from or write to memory. Control flow instructions change the sequence of execution. We're going to see all of those. We're going to start with operates since it's easier. So this is an operate instruction. High-level code, it has nothing to do with the registers, you can see. This is addition, right? You can express in your high-level code A equals B plus C. Assembly can be expressed this way, add A, B, C. Implicitly, A is a destination variable. It's not a register yet. Add is the mnemonic to indicate the operation to perform. B and C are the source operands. A is the destination operand, as you can see. And this is the semantic definition. Right? An ISA can be defined this way, but this is not the abstraction level of an ISA. An ISA really needs to define what the machine really sees. The machine doesn't see ABC. The machine sees register numbers, register numbers, memory addresses, and bits. Right? So we will see that. So we need to map the variables to registers, essentially. This is not what the machine could see. Uh, so, for example, B is mapped to R1, C is mapped to R2, A is mapped to R0 and LC3. In MIPS, there are similar registers again. These are uh, the registers. And again, uh, I'm going to show it in assembly, and then we're going to show the machine code, what the machine really sees. So, for example, this is add, R, add R1 and R2, write the result into R0 in LC3. So these are the field values. This is how it's encoded in LC3, 16 bits. You can look at the exact bits. Uh, and this is how it's encoded in the machine code. These are the exact bits, actually. This is the opcode, this is the destination register zero, source register one, and source register two happens to be two over here, right? And you can see the bit values over here. This is the most significant bit, this is the least significant bit. And you can write this in short, hexadecimal and machine code. That's our addition, basically, instruction uh, with some particular operands. And this way, the machine can read and decode all of these, right? We know exactly how to decode these now. You've seen the decoder. There's a decoder that decodes the opcode. That gets fed into the control unit, and the control unit says, oh, I've seen opcode 0001. These are the control signals that I should enable in the next cycle, next clock cycle, so that I can process this add instruction. Destination register, this, there's a special decoder, part of the register file, that says, 
you need to write to this destination register 000. When do you write to the register file? The instruction doesn't say anything about that. The control unit is going to decide that based on when it's processing the instructions. And we will see the instruction processing cycle. Same as source register one and source register two. And the control unit will ignore these bits because they don't matter. That's how it's defined in the instruction, actually, if you look at it. Okay, so instruction format defines all of this. So LT, LC3 has operate instruction formats. It looks like this basically upcode, destination register, source register, and source register two. And you know exactly which bits define what over here. Up is the upcode, what the instruction does. For add, it's 0001. For end, it's 0101. Basically, for every single upcode, you need to have an encoding. And SR1, SR2 are source registers. DR is the destination register. Hopefully, these are simple. And once you keep seeing this, they're going to be even simpler. So the instruction set architecture needs to specify the semantics of the instruction, of course. So semantics says destination register value should be set to uh, the source register one's value plus source register two's value. For and, this is not a plus or this is not an addition. It's an and basically, bitwise and. And again, this is defined by the instruction set architecture and the uh, hardware software interface. Essentially, th this is what the programmer assumes the instruction would do. It's up to the underlying implementation to make sure that this is actually what happens, right? Okay, and this is the encoding, as you can see, uh, a different, uh, well, yeah, for R6, R2, and R6. Okay, let's take a look at MIPS. MIPS is very similar. I'm, I'm using two different ISAs, but in the end, the principles of ISAs are very similar. So these days, risk 5 is hot, for example. risk 5 is... Very, sim very, 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 very similar to MIPS, let's say. It's a different version of MIPS, open source. For MIPS, if you want to develop a processor, you need to pay some company to develop the processor. For RISC-V, even though the ISA is very similar, you don't need to pay anyone. You can develop the processor yourself. That's the difference, basically. So uh, x86 is, of course, different, but x86 is a big mess. We don't want to deal with the encodings of x86 in this lecture. Uh, so, okay, MIPS assembly looks like this. Add S1 to S2, store the results in S0. So this corresponds to some field values. This is the instruction encoding defined by uh, the ISA, instruction set architecture. This is the opcode. Actually, this is part of the opcode. It's called funct uh, for some sort of instructions. This defines the opcode, actually. And then source register, uh, uh, another source register, destination register, and this is unused for this particular opcode at. Okay, this is the semantic definition. RD gets RS plus RT. And this is the machine code, basically, for this particular uh, encoding. So S0 happens to be 17, S1 happens to be 18, and S2 happens to be, sorry, S0 happens to be 16, S1 is 17, and S2 is 18. That's why I said 16, 17, 18 over here, based on what I showed earlier to you uh, in terms of MIPS register file. You don't need to remember all of this, of course, right? You just uh, consult a manual. And once you write an assembly like this, Somebody does this conversion from assembly code to machine code for you, and that's a compiler, essentially a machine code compiler. And this is the hexadecimal version, as you can see. So this is the R-type instruction format in MIPS, actually. It's a one type of operate instruction format. Actually, it's more than operates. Uh, there are three register operands, as you can see. Zero is the opcode, always. RS and RT are source registers. RD is the destination register. You can see that the registers are five bits because there are 32 general purpose registers in MIPS. Shamped is the shift amount. It's used only for shift operations. For other operations, ignore. Punct is the most important thing, perhaps. This is really an extended opcode. It's really the operation in R-type instructions. So zero means that this is an R-type instruction. It's not enough to understand what the opcode is. Zero just says, look at the bottom six bits. They're going to tell you what to do. So this is an instruction encoding. People play tricks in instruction encoding, basically so that they can save space, et cetera. So in order to decode this instruction, the processor, the logic in hardware needs to look at these bits. And if, it's, if they are zero, it needs to decode these bits. And funct 32 means an at in MIPS. If, if the value of funct is 32, it's an at. Okay, everything is good. Hopefully these are simple. We're gonna talk about the instruction processing cycle tomorrow, but let's talk about operate instructions. So operate instructions, uh, addition uh, or multiplication, for example, we tell the computer to execute arithmetic or logic computations. But we also need uh, instructions to access operands from memory. And this is really important because memory is far away, right? We need to load these locations uh, from memory to the registers. In some ISAs, instructions and architectures, 
you can directly input a memory location. So you can specify a memory address and say, add the location in this memory address, uh, add the value in this memory address to the value in this memory address and store the result in some other memory address. The ISAs that we're going to study are not like that. LC3 and MIPS, uh, they don't enable memory to memory operations. If you want to operate on a value that's coming from memory, you have to put it in a register first. These are called register to register architectures. Okay. Uh, but now uh, I'm giving you another option. X86, for example, you can do memory to memory operations. It's much more complicated. You don't have to go, to, you don't have to put a value into a register, basically. Okay. So uh, you need to load uh, the operands from the memory to the registers and store them from the registers to the memory if you want to write back a result, for example. So next we see how to read or load from memory. Writing or storing is performed in a similar way, but we're going to talk about that later. So let's load from memory first. So this is the load word instruction at a high level code. It's an array notation. Basically, this says little a gets uh, the value uh, at index i of this array. This is the base. Let's assume that there's a base address. You, you, uh, the index is i. Okay. So assembly can be like this at a high level. Uh, so load is a mnemonic to indicate the load word operation. We're going to load a word from this location, this memory location. A is the base address of the array where the array starts. I is the offset where the location, where the uh, where the elements that I want from this array is located. It's also called an immediate or literal or a constant. You'll see all of these uh, in your uh, in different architectures. A is the destination operand, and semantics is basically this: go to memory, calculate the address as a plus i, get the value, get the word in that location, store the results into variable a. Again, this is high level. We need to assign uh, uh, registers, right? For example, in LC3, let's, let's take a look at a specific example. I is equal to two, for example, right? In LC3 assembly, it looks like this. It's a load register instruction, LDR. Uh, address is calculated as R0, which is the base address of the array. You add to it two and write the result into uh, the, the value that you get from that location in memory into R3. So this is the semantics basic. I just said this, right? You calculate the address as R0, R0 plus two. There's a word that's located in that address and that uh, value is uh, written into R3 after the operation is complete. MIPS assembly is very similar. Assume that this is word addressable right now. MIPS is actually byte addressable, but again, you can ignore it for now. It looks like this. Uh, very similar as you can see, it's just the notation is a bit different, right? And the semantics is uh, load the, uh, calculate the address as S0 plus two, go to the memory with that address, get the value, word value in that address, load the word into location S3. S3 is going to be a register as we will see. These are mnemonics for the registers. Uh, so basically these instructions use a particular addressing mode. We're gonna talk about addressing modes tomorrow, but this is how the address is calculated. It's called the base plus offset addressing mode. You can see there's a base and there's an offset. And this is particularly useful when you're manipulating arrays or matrices, as we will see. So let's take a look at load word and byte addressable MIPS. Uh, so this is the MIPS ad assembly. So basically, because MIPS is byte addressable, uh, we actually, instead of saying word two, we multiply the word number with how many bytes there are in a word. So because we're looking at the second word, each word is four bytes. So we multiply two by four, so you get eight. That's the idea. So basically, byte address is calculated as word address times bytes divided by word. How many bytes in a word? And you've seen this earlier. So we're just exercising this in assembly. In MIPS, you have four bytes per word. If LC3 were byte addressable, you would have two bytes per word. But uh, LC3B is a byte addressable version of LC3, actually, as we will see. So uh, let's see where we are. Let me cover this, and then we're going to take a break. Uh, take not a break. Break until tomorrow. <laughs> So you can actually do this with an immediate also. So this is load register. Uh, so this is how the encoding actually is. This is what I showed you earlier, actually. This is how the encoding is, and this is specified in the instruction set architecture. The opcode is six. This is the destination register, base register, and there's an offset. This is a, in this case, a six-bit offset that specifies two. MIPS is very similar. Basically, you can see opcode, register, another register. One of them is destination, one of them is source. You need to know which one it is, of course. And then there's a longer immediate, 16-bit immediate. OK, so this is a great place to stop, as you can see. We're going to start with the instruction processing cycle. How to actually process these instructions, we're going to see tomorrow. 
and have a good day. I'll see you tomorrow.